Great. Welcome, everybody. I'm going to kick off this session of QC Core Insights. We want to extend a special welcome to all of you on this Valentine's Day. What better way to spend Valentine's evening than a robust discussion about biosynthetic and biological measures? I can't imagine anything either. I don't know why. But thanks for being here. And uh, we have actually very something special here, an international array of speakers. We have Megan Mellon-Smith, a chief resident for the University of Toronto in Canada, international place, and also uh, two fellows from the Cleveland Clinic, Kayla Parnell, uh, and also Ben Miller, who will be speaking to us tonight uh, about this topic. And um, I will turn it over to Kayla. Kayla? Thank you. Yes, I'm Kayla. I'm one of the Cleveland Clinic fellows, and I help lead the resident and fellow group of the ACHQC who put together this whole curriculum. And so just as a refresher, we're doing a monthly uh, webinar over various topics in hernia repair. Last week or last month, we talked about synthetic mesh. And this tonight, we're going to talk about absorbable synthetic and biologics. Um, and we have a whole year's worth of curriculum. So thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, this will be all resident and fellow um, presented. And after we present kind of just the the educational stuff, we're going to talk about two articles every single month. And so um, Dr. Ben Miller is on the call and he's another Cleveland Clinic fellow. He'll be talking about um, some two key articles after Megan presents some of the data. So take it away, Megan. Thank you very much. All right. So I'm just going to share my screen. The classic Zoom question. Can everyone see the screen? Okay. All right, so I uh, just want to shout out to Sergio and Matt for talking about synthetic mesh last month. Tonight, we're going to talk about the biosynthetics, the biologics, and even the hybrid mesh. So, my, why might you not want to use synthetic mesh? So, sorry, I think someone maybe needs to mute there. So let's take our average uh, high-risk ventral hernia patient in a contaminated field. You decide to take this patient for a ventral hernia repair and you use permanent synthetic mesh. It's no secret that these ventral hernia repairs are associated with a very high risk of wound infection. Unfortunately, in this patient, your wound infection turns into a chronic mesh infection. Maybe they even blow and enter a cutaneous fistula. Eventually, this leads to you having to explant this mesh and inevitably, inevitably a hernia recurrence. And we know that the next time we go around this same cycle, it's gonna be a more complex repair. So in order to break this vicious cycle, uh, the companies came up with the theme of biologic or biosynthetic mesh. And the underlying concept is that they prevent long-term wound complications. And this is because over time they completely reabsorb. Now there, there are some downsides. You can't even get on this pathway without a significant increase in cost. And you can imagine if you put a a mesh in to reinforce a hernia repair that then eventually completely goes away, you would think that you would still end up in the, recur in the recurrence hole. So let's talk about these uh, meshes sort of uh, one by one. We'll start with the biosynthetics. So the biosynthetics are made of a combination of four polymers. The first is the polyglycolic acid and this polymer absorbs very rapidly. It's usually co-polymerized with a, the polylactic acid or the PLA, which absorbs more slowly. There's also the trimethylene carbonate, which gives the mesh its elastic properties. And finally, there's the poly-4 hydroxybutyrate. And this polymer sort of has uh, components of each one of the polymers. So based on what your mesh involves, you can sort of depict how it's going to reabsorb. So, the theme of these meshes is that they create a scaffold and this allows the host tissues to engrow and it sort of facilitates wound healing. Um, our own native collagen is then deposited and completely replaces the mesh. So they absorb over a, a various variety of time depending on what, what polymer they're mostly uh, comprised of. And this is by hydrolysis and enzymatic pathways. And the theme is that they minimize the amount of foreign material that's left in the body, which prevents the risk of having a long-term chronic mesh infection, unlike this, the permanent synthetic mesh. 
So this is a busy slide, but it just sort of outlines all of the biosynthetic mesh that's currently available on the market. And we're gonna go through them one by one. So the tiger matrix. The tiger matrix is a dual filament mesh. 40% of it includes the polyglycolic acid, remembering that this is the rapidly absorbed polymer. So it goes away after four months. The other 60% of it includes mostly the polylactic acid, which is more slowly absorbed and it hangs around for 36 months. Uh, so you can see the, it starts out as quite a rigid piece of mesh. The rapidly absorbing particles go away, followed by the slowly absorbing, and eventually it's completely replaced by our own collagen. So this was studied back in 2014 in inguinal hernia repairs. Uh, unfortunately, at three years, they found a 40% recurrence rate and a 16% risk of chronic pain, which really is sort of unacceptable results for inguinal hernia repairs. It's also been used in um, 2016 in patients at risk for wound dehiscence. And uh, in these patients, um, it was used in an onlay fashion. And what they found was that at nine months, none of the patients dehisced. But ultimately, there's li little limited clinical data to support its use in incisional ventral hernia repair. Moving on to phasics. So Phasix is made up of the poly-4 hydroxybutyrate, and this is a natural polymer that's produced by E. coli. And you can see it forms this uh, knitted monofilament mesh. And it's degraded by hydrolysis, which has, and because it's a synthetic, or sorry, a natural polymer, it has no effect on wound pH. And this is important because it prevents a sort of a robust inflammatory response around the mesh. So this was studied in 2017 by a very nice multi-center prospective study, which I'm not going to talk about because it's going to be talked about later by Dr. Miller, but they had very good results in clean cases. I did want to talk briefly about the ATLAS trial, which was published in 2021. So in this study, they looked at 120 patients with relatively small hernias. They were all clean or class one cases, and all of these were done laparoscopically or robotically, and they used intra-abdominal phasics mesh. Of note, in this study, all of the fascia was closed. They had a very low risk of um, surgical site occurrences and no complications associated with the mesh. But unfortunately, at 24 months, which is long after phasix completely resolved, they had a quite a high recurrence rate. And what they found when they broke the hernias into small versus larger was that the larger hernias had an even higher recurrence rate of 43%. So their conclusion was that perhaps phasix could be used, but in small uh, incisional laparoscopic ventral hernias. Moving on to the gore bioA. So the gore bioA is um, sort of a, a laminar web microporous mesh. It's comprised mostly of the PGA, so it does go away quite quickly after six months. You can see it sort of looks like this multi-layer um, 3D web. And it was studied in 2017 in a prospective multi-center uh, study. They used uh, the gore bioA in both clean contaminated and contaminated uh, hernias. They had 104 patients. Um, you can see that they had quite a significant amount of patients requiring a bowel resection, a lot of patients with infected mesh, which could even be considered a dirty hernia, and they had a lot of patients um, requiring fistula takedown. Most of these hernia repairs, um, the mesh was placed in the retrorectus space. Um, they did have a reasonable uh, surgical site occurrence and infection rate, and at 17 months, the recurrence rate was 17%. But what they found is when they looked at the, the intraperitoneal mesh group compared to the retrorectus mesh group, they found an even more significant difference. So when the mesh was placed or tucked nicely in the retrorectus space, the recurrence rate went down to 13%. All of these patients had an improved quality of life. All right, going on to vicro mesh. So vicro mesh is composed mostly of the PGA, remembering that this goes away very quickly. So it loses its tensile strength at about two weeks and it's completely gone at two to three months. When I think of vicro mesh, I think about these disaster patients that you've taken back to the OR for an evisceration and you put the vicro mesh there to sort of hold their, in their viscera. This is a picture that I took myself when I was a PGY2 for this exact reason. And actually vicro mesh has been studied in damage control laparotomies in this paper in 2011. So this paper looked at 58 patients, all closed with vicro mesh bridge, uh, followed by a split thickness skin graft. And while they had a pretty high enterocutaneous fistula, fistula rate and an obvious 100% hernia rate, which you would expect with a mesh that goes away completely, 
all of the patients that made it through the initial hospitalization left the hospital. So in a damage control population, I'd say that's a win. The other use for FIPO mesh is in abdominal wall reconstruction is when you can't quite get the posterior rectus sheath back together. So in this study in 2016, they took synthetic mesh and they wrapped it in vipro mesh and they implanted it into pigs for 60 days. And what they found was that while they still had adhesions, um, what, when they looked at it histologically, the viscera had not adhesed to the actual synthetic mesh, but it, it had formed, the vipro mesh had formed a capsule to which the, the uh, bowel had um, adhesed to. So they said in their conclusion that Vipro was a useful adjunct for closing the posterior rectus sheath when you can't quite get it closed. But really are these meshes as good as they say? Do they compare to the polypropylene mesh? And while I couldn't find any sort of randomized evidence, there was a study done by the QC um, and this included over 2,000 patients. And they looked at the phasics in the BioA compared to polypropylene mesh in clean contaminated and contaminated cases. And at 30 days, what they found was that the biosynthetic patients had an increased risk of surgical site infections, an increased risk of surgical site infections requiring procedural intervention, and an increased reoperative um, risk. So none of the mesh had to be removed in any of these patients. But what they concluded was that perhaps the heavyweight microporous design of these mesh prevents um, early vascular ingrowth and prevents um, their ability to clear bacteria and actually increases their risk of having an early postoperative infection. So that's all I had to say about the biosynthetics. We're gonna move on to the biologics now. So biologic mesh really it originates from three species, cows, pigs, and humans. And it's made of dermis, intestine, or pericardium. Most commonly would be the dermis. So it's really the processing of these um, materials that affects the performance and makes these mesh so expensive. So they undergo washing, sterilization, and radiation, which removes all of the cellular elements and creates this extracellular biologic matrix. Then there's the process of cross-linking. And cross-linking really is not um, unique to mesh. It's sort of analogous to the process of tanning. So tanning is what um, you do to animal hides. It causes permanent cross-linking of the collagen and it makes the animal hide leather strong into a form that we can use and wear every day. So relating this back to biologic mesh, you can see that if you had a minimally cross-linked biologic mesh, it sort of acts as like an autogenous uh, piece of material to our tissue. It allows rapid revascularization. It's quite resistant to infection, but at the expense that it, it, it goes away quite quickly. If you have a more heavily cross-linked mesh, it re resists um, absorption and degradation, but it does qu cause quite a robust inflammatory response, which can lead to encapsulation and make it more prone to infection. So the concept of these meshes is similar to the biosynthetics in that um, our host cells sort of um, overtake the matrix and um, cause rapid um, regrowth and neovascularization. You can, say, you can see from this picture, this is um, a biologic mesh that's previously been implanted and it looks sort of like the tissue that's surrounding it. These completely absorb over time by hydrolysis and enzymatic reaction and their benefit or perceived benefit in the literature, literature is that they can be used in contaminated fields with this early cellular infiltration, they can clear bacteria and they avoid long-term uh, chronic mesh infections. So this is a slide that just shows all of the main biologic meshes that, is, that are on the market right now. I just want to point out a few things. So you can see most of them are made of dermis and that um, the only cross-linked one that's available is one of the only cross-linked ones that's available is the permacol. And there's some, um, it's not randomized data, but there is some data to suggest that this has a lower recurrence rate than the stratus. And that would make sense because remembering that the cross-linked mesh is more like leather. The other thing I wanted to point out is the extreme cost of these mesh. They are very, very expensive. We're gonna talk about the recurrence rates in the coming slides. So I wanted to focus on stratus. Stratus is a non-cross-linked porcine, like pig-derived dermis. And uh, it's really the market leader. 
in terms of all of the biologic mesh for incisional hernia repair. So I wanted to outline this study. Uh, this was done in 2016 and it looked at all of the different biologic meshes. They had 223 patients, they had sizable hernias and they had a very um, comorbid and contaminated patient population. What they found at 18 months was that compared to all the other biologic meshes, Stratus had the lowest risk of recurrence at 14.7%. There was no difference in wound events or surgical site infections across the board for all the meshes. And the risk of mesh infection was extremely low and none of these meshes had to come out. The other study I wanted to highlight was the, the RICH study. And this was a multi-center prospective study. They looked at single stage repairs of contaminated hernias in a high risk population and they used stratus mesh. So they had 80 patients and they followed them for two years. They had sort of a split between clean contaminated and contaminated patients. Um, they had more intraperitoneal than retrorectus mesh, but the most, one of the more important parts of the study was that they did have 20% of patients which did require a bridge, mesh bridge. They couldn't get the fascia together. Their wound, in, their wound event rate was high, which is not surprising in a contaminated, contaminated patient population. But I think their most important um, uh, outcome was their recurrence rate. So what they found was that um, with fascial closure, the recurrence rate was 23%, but without fascial closure, it was as high as 44%. So really these meshes can't be used in a bridging fashion with an acceptable recurrence rate. All right, so how does it compare to synthetic mesh? I wanted to talk about the price trial. It was the first randomized control trial comparing head-to-head -head stratus mesh versus polypropylene mesh. Uh, they had 165 patients, they had sizable hernias, but they did have mostly clean cases. 70% of their cases were clean. They were uh, comorbid patients though. They used a variety of different hernia repairs. And in terms of wound complications, interestingly, the stratus and the polypropylene um, were similar. Five of the polypropylene meshes did have to be explanted. Most of them were explanted for MRSA. And one of the biologics had to be explanted. Interestingly, it was taken out because of an enterocutaneous fistula. The overall recurrence rate um, was significantly higher for the stratus mesh compared to the polypropylene mesh. And this was their overall data, but when they did a contaminated subgroup analysis, looking just at the um, contaminated, the class two to four patients, they found an even more ro robust response with a 50% recurrence rate with stratus mesh, which really is unacceptable. <clears throat> Moving on to the hybrid mesh. So these are marketed sort of as the best of both worlds. They contain a biologic or a biosynthetic component and all of its um, good properties like reducing foreign body response, limiting inflammation. And then they also contain a permanent component and this helps to increase the durability of these mesh. Um, because there is uh, the biologic component associated with the permanent component, the theory is that you need less permanent material for these mesh. There's really three that are available on the market right now. And the first is the Ovatex and it's made of sheep extracellular matrix and you can get it mixed with the polypropylene which is permanent or you can have, get a fully resorbable version of it as well with the polyglycolic acid. There's also the Xenopro, which is made of porcine small intestine with polypropylene. And then the Synercore, which is the Gore BioA uh, with PTFE. So I'm just going to talk quickly about the Ovatex. So you can see that the Ovatex, this is a picture of it here on the right, it's made of multiple layers of sheep foregut extracellular matrix. And then it's sort of woven together with polypropylene mesh in this lock stitch fashion. So if you were to cut into this mesh, it wouldn't unravel. Um, the total composition of the mesh is made up of 95% of the extracellular matrix and very only a small amount of the, of the polypropylene. There's been a few studies on this, but I think one of the biggest sort of prospective multi-center studies was the Bravo study. And this was published in 2021. They had 76 patients. Most of the, the cases were clean, but they, the one thing that they sort of say in this is that they had a lot of obese patients um, who had previously had hernia repairs. So they, quite a comorbid patient population. The hernia defects um, were, were sizable and um, they had a variety of different hernia repairs that they, that they used. At 12 months, they had the lowest recurrence rate of any of the recurrence rates that I've quoted you here today at 3%. And only one of these meshes had to be removed. Uh, their um, 
surgical site, uh, the surgical site infection rate was also quite low. So though these are very good results, it's not randomized data. They had no control arm. They used a variety of different hernia repairs and they had mostly clean cases. So I think that this, this should be taken with a grain of salt. So now that we've talked about all the different um, types of mesh, I just quickly wanna talk about when you use these. So I'm just gonna talk about the classic teaching I'm studying for my Royal College exam right now and I spend a lot of time on up to date. So if you go on up to date and you type in contaminated hernia, you'll find something like this. So a class one hernia, really you should prepare this as synthetic mesh and there's no evidence to suggest to use any other mesh in any circumstance. So fix these with synthetic mesh. Uh, clean contaminated or class two or three cases. So when you start getting into small bowel resections, ostomy closures, this is where the concept of biologic and biosynthetic mesh comes up. And I have shown you some decent uh, data with the, the COBRA study showing a 17% recurrence and the RICH study showing a 23% recurrence. But until recently, high level evidence was lacking. Moving on to class four, if you have an existed infected mesh sitting in your hernia repair, this is an absolute no for um, putting in a, a new piece of mesh. And really this should be done as a staged repair. Uh, the other sort of guidelines that you can find online is by the Ventral Hernia Working Group, and this was published back in 2010, and they created a grading system, and they looked at not only wound class, but also patient comorbidities, and this helped, they made this grading system to predict post-operative surgical site occurrence, and with this grading system, they also published some mesh recommendations. So you can see grade one is, um, they leave it up to surgical preference, but starting at even grade two, they say that there's a medical risk for using synthetic mesh, and there's a potential advantage of using biologic mesh, all the way up to grade four, where they say absolutely do not use a synthetic mesh. <clears throat> then this paper came out, and I'm not going to discuss this paper because Dr. Miller is going to discuss this paper, but really, I think that this has been practice changing, and all of those guidelines and grading classifications that I just showed you I think really should be updated after some of this, some of this new data. So let's go back to our, our gentleman from the beginning, a 45 year old male with a, who's in for a Hartman's reversal. You can obviously see from his hernia repair that he's had a previous evisceration. He has a 15 centimeter midline hernia defect and a five centimeter uh, peristomal hernia defect. So I wanted to introduce the fight or flight concept, which was published by Dr. Petro and Dr. Rosen in 2018. So if you don't buy any of the, data that I just told you, I think it's perfectly reasonable to bring this patient to the operating room, reverse the stoma, get rid of any other infection in there, and then bring them back for a delayed definitive repair. This obviously does come at the cost of putting this patient through two major operations and the associated hospital costs and length of stay, etc. But it really uh, doesn't burn any bridges for the future. There's really, you really have one good shot at the retroactive space. So if you're not comfortable with abdominal wall reconstruction, I think this is a perfectly um, reasonable way to go. However, if you have an optimized patient and you're comfortable with abdominal wall reconstruction, I, I think based on new evidence that it's very reasonable to give it a shot. I think if you can get that mesh tucked nicely in the retroactive space, it really doesn't even matter which type of mesh you use. You have to accept the fact that there is a high risk of wound complications in these patients, but often the mesh is salvageable and you don't have to take it out. You can just debride pieces of it. And um, there's mounting evidence to suggest that the long-term outcomes with synthetic mesh is excellent. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. From Toronto. Next, we'll have Ben Miller presenting uh, two papers, a paper about um, phasics and another paper from Dr. Rosen's group on biologic versus synthetic. So go ahead, Dr. Miller. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Kayla? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay. <laughs> Okay. All right. So uh, thanks, Kayla. So we're going to talk about two articles. The first article is about phasics mesh, and the second article is about biologic versus synthetic mesh. So let's get started. Uh, 
So the first article was published last year in the Annals of Medicine and Surgery. This is a prospective multicenter study of phasix mesh for ventral hernia repairs in a cohort at risk for complications. And this was a three-year follow-up of this, uh, this study. So they included adult patients with hernias 10 to 350 square centimeters. They had to have less than four hernia recurrences. And all of these patients were, uh, had, these were all clean cases. The exclusion criteria, criteria listed on the right there, you can see, I just wanna point out that again, they excluded. Can you share sorry. your screen? Can you share your yeah, screen? I thought I shared it. Thanks for stopping me. All good. Oh, I forgot to click share. Perfect, thanks. We can okay. see it. Okay, great, here we go. So this was the first slide, here's the second slide. Uh, okay, um, so they're all clean cases. These were done uh, either with onlay or retrorectus mesh placement, and they had five centimeters of mesh overlap and it was fixated with suture. They were allowed to do a component separation if they thought it was necessary, and the fascia was closed in all of these patients. They, their primary outcomes were hernia recurrence and surgical site infection. Recurrences were diagnosed on physical exam, and the authors commented that hernias found incidentally on CT scan or MRI were evaluated for clinical significance. Surgical site infections were diagnosed on physical exam and confirmed with gram stain and culture. Secondary outcomes included pain, assessed with the visual analog scale and quality of life, assessed with the Carolina's comfort scale and a 12 item short form health survey. Table one shows the flow of the, of the patients. So there were 139 patients who were consented and then 121 who had mesh placed who underwent, underwent ventral hernia repair. And that is, those patients were in the modified intent to treat population. There are two other groups of patients here on this flow chart I just wanna point out. The patients who met the intraoperative inclusion and excluding criteria, and then the per protocol population. And I just point this out because they were not defined in the article. It shows here in this chart that 55 patients withdrew from the study. So 66 patients completed the study. And then in table two, there were 82 patients who completed 36 month follow-up. And this just shows some demographic data. So I was a little confused between table one and table two. Table one looks like there are 66 patients in the study who met, who were there for, who uh, completed 36 month follow-up. And then in table two, it looks like there were 82. So I'm not exactly sure the difference is there. Table three shows the comorbidities of these patients. And then table four shows the, sorry, I need to minimize the screen. Anyway, table four shows the, the uh, operative characteristics. So about three quarters of these patients had a retrorectus repair and about a quarter of them had uh, online mesh placed. So here are the results of their primary endpoints. So there were 17 patients who had a hernia recurrence and this was described as a recurrence rate of 18%. However, I'm not exactly sure based on their N of 17, how they got this recurrence rate because there's no denominator listed. And um, anyway, the patient, the, the, the numbers that they give in the, in the first two tables, either 66 or 121 don't add up to 18%. So I'm not sure where 18% comes from. Surgical site infections is about 9%. And then they looked, secondary outcomes were SSOPIs, about 6%, and then reoperations, almost 12%. And mesh-related adverse events were pretty high in this cohort, 16%. You can see the Kaplan-Meier curve, uh, time to hernia recurrence, and time to SSI. I think it's interesting that at this point, like Megan pointed out, at 36 months, the, the mesh is totally replaced by native tissue. And you can see that recurrences are still happening even after 36 months. So I assume that as the years go by, they will continue to happen, but we don't have that data yet. And then you can see the pain improved from baseline. And then the authors describe in their methods that they were assessing quality of life, but none of the, none of the quality of life outcomes were included in the results. So the authors concluded that recurrence rates with phasix mesh at three years are about 18%, but I, I couldn't find how they came to that number. If there are 66 patients in the study, then the recurrence rate is about 26% if there are 17 recurrences. And then SSIs and mesh-related adverse events and reoperations seemed a little high for clean cases. Uh, if you, the paper we looked at last month, the heavyweight, medium weight paper, the SSIs, mesh-related adverse events um, and reoperations were much lower than that paper uh, with, with all clean cases as well. And I was just curious as what, the, what the, the, some, I would like to know some of the cost data, like how much phasix mesh costs. All right, I'm gonna keep going, Kayla. Um, you wanna stop and talk here? 
Yeah, do y'all want to stop and discuss this article a little bit more in depth and then we can move on to the next article after that? I can start us off with a question. I was just wondering for the experts on this call, um, I thought I fundamentally, I've always thought that phasics or absorbable synthetic meshes are used in more contaminated situations, situations where you want to avoid you know, a permanent mesh. Um, and this study was designed only in clean cases. So I was just wondering kind of just the thought process behind the study design and why um, y'all only chose to um, do this in clean cases. Yeah, I can, I can uh, kick off the answer to that, Kayla. Um, so yeah, I think certainly for most practices, uh, that is our bias is you save, uh, absorbable meshes or even biologics for the more challenging uh, scenarios. It's interesting about phasics um, and some of this data came out of the QC, um, you know, phasics uh, is, is behaves a lot like heavyweight polypropylene um, up front. So I actually would avoid placing this in contaminated situations because, uh, you know, it just feels and, and weighs like heavyweight polypropylene. So um, I think all these meshes, including biologics, uh, are actually indicated for clean scenarios. Um, and, uh, and that was the original intent. Now, certainly uh, many of us use it for off-label uses, including in contaminated situations, but also holds for permanent synthetics as well. Um, but I think the, the bigger discussion to have here is, especially if you kind of go back to some of the discussion on the chat and patients just prefer these type of products as opposed to permanent synthetic meshes, should we be offering these in more in class one scenarios? Uh, and again, I know it's a very controversial type of thing, uh, even without the discussion of cost, when you add in cost, certainly uh, it, it leads to more interesting discussions. Yeah, curious to see what people think. Well, Kayla, I, I would just answer that question slightly different than Ben. I would just say um, that, you know, when you design a trial, I think you want as homogeneous a group as possible, particularly when you're kind of asking a question about how does a mesh perform? So um, I think it's perfectly acceptable to design these trials in clean cases for the kind of initial assessment of the mesh. I just think kind of, as you pointed out, and I think uh, Ben Miller did as well, is just, that doesn't mean you can extrapolate those results to contaminated cases. And so I think it, as you look at all this data and you put together everything Megan said, I think that it's a, it's, there's a lot of things going on. And so you just wanna make sure that you're looking at apples to apples when we think about all these different type of things. And I mean, I, I'll address Ben, but maybe some other people wanna to talk too. I, I think you know shared decision-making and talking with patients is super important. Um, and I think a lot of times you just have to understand why they're coming from that point of view and have a conversation about it. Um, I think you guys have been to my clinic. I, I don't think there's a ton of shared decision making that goes on. There's a lot of people that come in with the bias and then we sit down and we talk about it and I explain kind of why I feel the way I feel about it. And, and you know, then we kind of come to some general agreement, but um, I, I don't, it's, it's pretty rare, I think, for me that a patient makes that decision. It's extremely common that we have a conversation about why they feel the way they feel and, and you know, what they may or may not want. I, I, I don't know what you think, Ben. Yeah, you know, I got to say, I, I think more and more patients are uh, having these uh, thoughts on their own um, and in terms of uh, coming to clinic visits with an idea of mesh product, not necessarily uh, brands, but just kind of classes of mesh that they may or may not be interested in. And I, mean, I think this is just the natural iteration of what's happening in the lay public, especially with all the medical legal issues going on right now. And so um, I think most people associate those medical legal issues with permanent synthetic meshes. So then I think in most people's mind, if there are alternatives, um, it's, it's a pretty attractive option for a lot of people. Now, a lot of us, when they come see us in clinic, I mean, we have pretty pragmatic discussions with them, but it does beg the question, you know, should we be having more discussions about the array of products available? 
because I think in even in um, you know um, strict purchasing uh, hosp in, in hospitals with strict purchasing rules, most of us have a biologic, a biosynthetic, and of course the permanent synthetics. Why do you think, if we go back to these results, why do you think that the mesh related adverse events were so high in with phasix mesh? It seems really high to me. Now, I don't know enough about phasix to, to answer that question, but I thought maybe someone had an idea. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you know, all these studies, it's really difficult to draw a lot of conclusions from because there's really no comparison arm, uh, again, which is a pretty common way for these studies to be uh, performed. And yeah, I was one of the co-authors of this. Um, you know, if you look at the biosynthetics or the resorbables, um, the, the reason why they work, and in general, they work pretty well, um, is because they create a pretty intense inflammatory reaction. And, you know, the connotation we have is that they just kind of go away. I mean, yeah, they, they resorb, but they're replaced by scar plate and tissue and, and kind of chronic inflammatory tissue. So I think if you think of it in terms of that, yeah, you are going to have some pretty intense inflammatory reactions, whether it's, you know, uh, a higher rate than other types of meshes, that I don't know. Also, Ben, you kind of pointed out, this is, um, uh, this included uh, an onlay component as well. Right. So I think like, just like different surgical techniques have their pros and cons and complication profiles, it's important to kind of look at those it, within that. And if I remember correctly, I think that that was one of the things about the onlay group actually had a few more of those. That's not to say that onlay is not perfectly acceptable. It's, it's just that that's an issue. And I think kind of to Ben's point about, and I, this is again, why I think this data is important. And I think this trial is important is because, you know, if you have that conversation with the patient and they don't want something permanent, everything is a risk benefit. So there, there's a cost to not having something permanent in there. And perhaps that's a slightly higher recurrence rate that, you know, like you said, they didn't talk about the quality of life or anything, but but maybe the quality of life is the same. And so who cares? But, but I think, um, I think this just adds to it, but I, but I really think it's just so key that when you look at all the data that Megan showed and what you showed, there's so many things skipping across different types of hernias, different types of techniques, different types of mess locations, different types of patients, different wound classes. And then at the end we say, okay, well, here's synthetic results, here's biosynthetic results. And we just gotta be careful it's more complex than that, which is sometimes hard to digest. As yeah, a there's a, oh, go ahead, Kim. I just say as a trainee, I feel like that's like the hardest thing to, to learn about this is trying to like, you know, cipher through all these papers and figure out what types of hernias each of these papers is like applicable to. And like, there's just, like you said, they're not all apples to apples. And so I feel like, it's just, it's just really difficult to tease through all of this, so. And by the way, it's okay that it's hard to understand hernias. It doesn't make it bad. There's 40 people on Valentine's Day here to listen to Mesh. So obviously this is hard and there'll be countless people that listen to it on our website. But I, I think that is the hardest thing to realize is this stuff is complicated and it's not one Mesh, it's not one technique. It's hard, so we're here to learn and that, that's good. That's okay. And we should be honest with our patients about that too, that we don't have all the answers right now. I, I, that's how I approach it. I think like that was one thing, like the most frustrating part about going through all the data was the heterogeneity in the types of repairs. I kept having to go back and look at these trials over and over again. Cause I was like, wait, were they on layer at rectorectus? Like they're all so different. So you're right, they're hard to compare. But the other thing is, is that if like one of the main outcomes that every trial reports is recurrence, like why would you ever want a mesh that goes away just for the sake of having a, something that's not permanent in you? Like, I don't, I don't buy that. I don't get that. That's how I felt with this Roth paper, because most of these people were, most of these people were obese. A big majority of, of them had recurrent hernias. That's a patient who I'm like, a recurrent hernia and an obese patient, they need synthetic permanent mesh. But 
I, you know, I guess I can't approach it them all like that. Everybody's different. <laughs> but but yeah, Kayla, go, go, ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Mike. I, I was gonna say, Kayla, last month we looked at the data of why you use mesh from Lewandike and Berger. And those recurrence rates, I, I think if Megan was talking about it today, would say they're unacceptable with synthetic mesh. They were less than the primary repair, but there's a lot of room for improvement. I mean, it's, you know, those are just, that's just the data. That's fair. However, most of those patients were bridged in that paper, <laughs> okay. but that's fair. Looks like Don had a question. Did you, you see that? I was just gonna make a comment. You have to, rem I don't think that, uh, many of you are currently in training understand the history here. And the history of the Phasix trial is working off the COBRA trial, which was working off the ventral hernia working group, all of which suggested that there was a group of patients that did not have an active infection who are at increased risk of having de novo infection of the wound and infecting a permanent synthetic mesh. And so the Phasix trial was answering that, trying to answer that question. Do you have to use an absorbable mesh in that type of patient? Yeah, and Don, the other point you bring up in the chat, I think is a good one. Um, sometimes it's really difficult when you're doing these trials to determine if it's actually a mesh-related complication or not mesh-related complication. Um, it's so hard to do that. Um, so... Um, a couple of themes are coming up in the chat. Maybe what we can do is uh, um, go to the next study and then have kind of a discussion on a couple of these themes that are coming up. Does that sound good, Kayla? Okay, so this study was, was just e-published last month in JAMA Surgery. This is from the group at the Cleveland Clinic, compared biologic to synthetic mesh and the single stage repair of contaminated ventral hernias. So the authors included patients that are over 21, a hernia defects greater than nine centimeters squared, and these were all clean contaminated or contaminated hernias, and they were repaired, repaired electively. They're all single stage repairs. You can see the exclusion criteria listed over there. So every patient had a retromuscular mesh placed and uh, fascia was closed in all patients. So the primary endpoint of the study was hernia recurrence at two years. And hernia recurrence was, was a defined or was evaluated on exam, CT or ultrasound, or a patient reported bulge. And there were several secondary endpoints, including mesh safety that was assessed uh, using SSOPIs up to two years, uh, adverse events, and the quality of life, which was assessed using the EQ5D descriptive system, which evaluates uh, five domains of the global quality of life, an EQ5D uh, visual analog scale, which asks patients to rate their overall health on a scale of one to 100, and then Hercules, which is the hernia-specific quality of life tool, and then cost was also assessed. This is a superiority trial powered to detect a significant difference in rates of hernia occurrence based on historical uh, recurrence rates, which were 29% for biologic and 9% for synthetic mesh. And randomization occurred in the operating room just before mesh was placed. So this is a schematic of the consort diagram from the study. 253 patients were randomized, 127 to biologic mesh, 126 to synthetic mesh. You can see the 30 day, six month and one year follow-up. And this study had a really good follow-up at two years. So 118 of the biologic mesh patients were around and 115 of the synthetic mesh patients. Table one, this is the first half of table one that shows the groups were well matched with respect to medical comorbidities. This is the second half of table one that shows that the groups were also well matched with respect to hernia characteristics. Table two shows that the groups uh, were similar with respect to uh, ASA classification and the source of contamination. A lot of these patients went bowel resection or ostomy reversal. And then, uh, this also shows that the only, so the only significant difference in the operative char characteristics of these patients uh, was that in the beginning of the trial, the only biologic mesh that was available was 20 by 30 centimeters. And so the, the biologic mesh was significantly smaller than the synthetic mesh. And this also resulted in a significantly smaller mesh to defect ratio for biologic compared to synthetic mesh. 97% follow-up at two years. The authors used the intent to treat hernia recurrence rate at two years. So that's all the patients uh, that were randomized, not just the patients that had follow-up. And the recurrence rate for biologic mesh was 20.5%, which is actually better than historic rates. And synthetic mesh uh, was five, the recurrence rate was 5.5%, which is also better than historic rates. So there's an absolute risk reduction of almost 15% uh, for synthetic mesh. This Kaplan-Meier plot uh, shows time hernia recurrence a favor synthetic over biologic mesh. 
And then this multivariate regression uh, table shows that synthetic mesh, uh, that patients who had synthetic mesh placed were less likely uh, to develop a hernia recurrence. And I think this is also important to note that mesh, uh, mesh size and mesh to defect ratio were not associated with hernia recurrence. This table shows the wound morbidity outcomes and they were similar really between the two treatment arms, both um, SSOPIs and SSIs and SSOs. The only trend was that the, the patients who had biologic mesh placed were a little bit more likely to develop deep surgical site infections. Patients with biologic mesh also had more adverse events. Most of these adverse events were wound morbidity and, and ileus. So there was an absolute risk reduction, again, of almost 15% for synthetic mesh with regards to adverse events. However, there were no mesh-related reoperations in either treatment arm uh, at six months. And perhaps most importantly, the, the quality of life uh, at two years measured by the EQ5D and the EQ5D VAS uh, were similar between both treatment arms. And quality of life measured by Hercules was also similar for biologic and synthetic mesh. Cost, as you might imagine, was a lot higher for biologic mesh. And this is mainly driven by the price of the biologic mesh, which was about $21,000 compared to synthetic mesh, which was $100. So in conclusion, I, these are the conclusions I drew that synthetic mesh appears to be safe in class two and class three uh, cases. There were fewer recurrences with synthetic compared to biologic mesh. There were more adverse events with biologic mesh, but in the end, the quality of life is the same. But I think cost should be considered because each piece of this stratus mesh was $21,000. So takeaways, I think if you're already using synthetic mesh in type in, uh, in class two and class three cases, now you have level one evidence to support your practice. If you prefer to use biologic mesh in class two and three cases, I think you can tell your patients that the quality of life is the same with either mesh type. That's it. Great presentation, Ben. Thanks. Uh, I guess I'll start it off again. <laughs> Question. The majority of these patients looks like underwent a TAR. Um, if the general surgeon population in the community, if they're not comfortable with the TAR, do you feel like we can, you know, apply these results to, you know, other types of repairs or like, yeah, do we have to just we have to like only apply these results to patients who undergo a TAR is my question. Cause not a lot of, not everybody's doing a TAR. Are you asking me? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I think that these hernia repairs were done um, at centers of excellence by excellent surgeons who do, you know, most of these were big retromuscular repairs and these just, I don't think that these are being done by a lot of people in the community. So can you generalize these results? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, it's, it's, a, great, it's a great question. I, I don't know that you, that you can. Um, I don't know that they can be generalized to the on-light placement, uh, perhaps maybe to retrorectus. I know more people do retrorectus repairs, so maybe you could generalize them to, to you know, retrorectus repairs. I think that'd be fair. Um, but yeah, I don't know that, that the average general surgery in community practice, that they're gonna, they're gonna say, this is the, you know, this is, this is the nail in the coffin for synthetic mesh for me or for biologic mesh for me. I, I'll add to, I mean, I absolutely don't think that these results are generalized. Um, I, I think like all randomized controlled trials, the external validity, uh, if it's a well done trial, you got to control for a lot of things, right? So when you try and control for technique and to get to places that do enough to do a trial, um, it's unlikely that you're going to have a lot of kind of average, like, you know, I, I don't mean by average technically, I just mean they do a lot of other things and they fix a couple of hernias every once in a while. It's unlikely that you're going to get those people. So I think that, um, you know, the pros of having a trial that is kind of a little bit more heavily expert based is that you arguably put both materials in the best possible situation to work. So you get a good look at best case scenario, what can you expect from these two materials? But then to take that and say that everybody should give up on every other mesh but medium weight polypropylene, I think that's a gigantic leap. I, I, I don't 
think that this data kind of does that. And I agree with what Ben said, which is that, you know, if you have been doing TARS and you have been using synthetic mesh in these circumstances of, you know, CDC two and three, there's now level one evidence that suggests that that's a safe thing to do. For people to switch based on this, I think there's a lot more, you need to know your own data, you need to know what your outcomes are, you need to know what your experiences are. And there's, you know, still plenty of room for not using me. Like, well, but I just guess to me, I just wonder a little bit more of kind of what Megan said, which is maybe those are the people that you just don't do a simultaneous repair on and you just come back another day. And this is not cancer. Everybody doesn't need an R0 hernia operation for the first one. You can temporize things and come back another day. Yeah, so there's a lot of a lot of interesting things, a lot of inter interesting topics coming up in the chat here. Um, maybe I can split it up into two themes. Um, the first is we've been talking a lot about uh, price and cost, and also uh, kind of getting at this idea that we haven't mentioned, but it's it's out there, and that is, um, are some of these resorbable meshes or biologics resulting in less long-term catastrophic complications? Therefore we're willing to pay a premium for that. Again, we don't know that at this point, but it gets to this point of, um, yeah, they're higher cost and um, pay, some patients uh, may request it. And should we, should we honor this idea of, okay, some patients may be willing to pay a premium for this. And I know patients don't necessarily are sensitive to the cost of this, but should we as a group of surgeons accept the fact that we may be willing to pay a premium for patient preference. I mean, that's really hard to answer that question. I think you just have to have a conversation with patients, right? Like I, I think, um, I, I think it depends on the hernia and the patient and all those things. I, I think for some people recurrence probably really matters. If you have a teeny small hernia, I think, not having it come back matters. I, I think this data suggests that having a conversation about quality of life with people is maybe more important for these really complicated hernias. And, um, you know, I, I would just add that the fact that the quality of life didn't mirror the recurrence, I, I think there's two possible explanations for that. I don't have the answer to either one. One is, the tools that we use, the Hercules and the EQ5D, which is both a, a hernia specific and a generic, just aren't specific and, and accurate enough to identify quality of life associated with recurrence. That, that's a possibility. The second possibility is that, you know, these people, uh, a small recurrence that we picked up on CT scan doesn't bother them. And they're happy and they have on two separate measures literally the exact same graphs so i i do think and i mean to kind of your point ben since we've become kind of abdominal core health surgeons it is that really where we should be going which is these measures that matter the most at uh, 10 years ago when we designed this trial i don't think anybody would have accepted quality of life as a primary outcome because we didn't understand it but i think in 2022 it begs the question of, you know, what I think Luke asked where the goalposts are. It does beg the question, if we have the right tools to measure, is this what we really ought to be looking at? Yeah, that was, that was the second big theme I think it was worth uh, uh, chatting about is, uh, I think to me, that's the most striking finding about this trial is that, you know, the recurrence rates were what it was for each arm, but that quality of life improvement uh, is pretty impressive. I don't know. I think Hercules is pretty sensitive. EQ5D, maybe not so much because it's just gen generic, but Hercules is pretty, you know, I think on par with, uh, uh, with, with, with hernia. And, um, yeah, to me, that was, that was really surprising. Mike, do you remember, did we capture any of the recurrence data as far as size and stuff? I don't, I don't think we did in the trial, did we? We have recurrence data as far as reoperation. Um, and, and, you know, symptomatic versus asymptomatic. And I think it's, it is relevant to say in this, because I think somebody, you know, like we talked about this before, but measuring recurrence is really, really difficult. And there is a broad kind of confidence interval of recurrence. 
And I, I would just stress in this trial, I think like 70% of those follow-up patients had radiographic imaging um, and, and, or a clinical exam. I think it, it takes you up to like 95%. So a very small percentage of people had the bulge question alone. And I don't think there were almost any hernias, maybe less than two that were just a bulge, yes, without further imaging. So this is a pretty tight confidence interval. And likely when you're picking up on CT scans for big complex hernias, you might find small things that were reviewed by blinded reviewers. So I, I do think that, um, that that's my other explanation for this is some of these recurrences are just small. They might get bigger. They might require reoperations later in life. I mean, we don't know the answer to that. We have to wait 10 years, but, but I think that's also why the recurrent, the radiographic recurrence rate might not match the quality of life of the patients. I just say one other thing as I was reading about EQ5D, and there's a, there's a nice video online. And the, the two things that really matter to patients are, are the length of their life and the quality of their life. And so we, you know, aren't, we're not cancer surgeons. We're not impacting the length of their life really. Uh, but I think we can impact their quality of life. And, and I think going forward, it's a good point that like, I think that, that we should probably be looking at quality of life. We care about recurrences as surgeons, but the patients, they care about the quality of life. And, and Ben, I would just add, I, I think it's interesting. How do you take this data and apply it to absorbable synthetics? Because I think um, that's an unknown. I, I think one of the things that this paper should do is kind of raise the bar a little bit of you know, absorbable synthetics now need to kind of show their cost effectiveness, not just their cost, but their cost effectiveness in some of these more challenging cases since we already have baseline data on how they perform in clean. So I think it is now time to kind of put those head to head because you can't really compare this results to any of the stuff that was talked about before other than I, I think fairly the COBRA trial because it was kind of a, a somewhat similar group, although not exactly. Um, so I think you just gotta be careful doing that. But I, I think that the, the problem when you look at cost effectiveness is that when you're starting with a synthetic mess, it's hundred dollars, it has these results. You're gonna have to beat those results by a lot for cost effectiveness. Like it's not just gonna be a tie. You, if it costs more, it's gonna have to be better for, I don't know, like, you know, reduce the surgical site infection rate or something. It's kind of, you know, and if you look at quality of life, it's pretty good. So I think the bar is high, but it should be done. Yeah, and Mike, that was the, uh, that cost effectiveness analysis that we did a couple of years ago got to just that point as what would that bar have to be to make, to justify the cost of biosynthetics, resorbables, or biologics? And I think this gets to the, uh, the big question, and that is um, how do any of these meshes, if at all, reduce low rate catastrophic complications that are happening long term. I mean, that's the big thing that we want to try to avoid, especially with permanent synthetic meshes, is the mesh infection that occurs five to seven years later. I know George Bailey, our FDA colleague, is, is on this Zoom as well. I, and certainly, um, you know, those are the things that our regulatory colleagues and also our industry partners, you know, those are the things we want to avoid and patients want to avoid. So um, randomized trials don't answer that just because it just takes a lot of patients to gather up those low rate events. And that's where registries like the QC and other registries uh, in Europe specifically can help answer those things. So the, the next question that I think that's really worth trying to get at is um, how can we detect these low rate catastrophic complications on a wide scale to see if any of these products actually reduce that? Because if you reduce one mesh infection that leads to an explantation in five years, that completely changes the cost effectiveness um, uh, equation. And it doesn't take a whole lot. Uh, but again, that's still unknown right now. As far as we know, they're equivalent. But I think that's the big question that remains to be answered. I, I would just tag on to that. I, I think, you know, if you take any of these trials, including this one, and you say, okay, well, I'm going to change my practice. And I'm going to start doing this now. I think this is where on a micro and macro level, this is where you have to be tracking your data so that you can watch your own graph and you can reliably say, okay, these are the results of these people in this trial. 
if I start to veer off that curve because of my patients are more complicated than theirs, where I live, people won't quit smoking. I don't do as many of these cases. Whatever that is, I think is where you can kind of say, okay, well, this data might not apply to me and what I'm doing works in my hands. And I always think there's space for that. And I think that's just to your point is one randomized control trial isn't gonna answer everything. I think there is a ecosystem of data and there is a randomized control trial can answer some basic questions, but then you need the registry in the background to measure kind of what the real world is. And then what happens when if everybody starts putting synthetic mesh in every clean contaminated, contaminated case, I don't envision great outcomes with that. I think that could be a disaster, but that goes more to me and kind of begs the question, which is a much more difficult question, which is, is that the mesh's fault? Or is that that these techniques are not broadly applicable to everybody in the real world? And a lot of times when things go wrong, we blame the mesh. And when things go right, we take credit for it as surgeons. And so I think that that is the kind of subtlety and I would just say, I think, Ben, if you go back, you had that slide where we actually did pick up like just a little bit of a signal as far as surgeon and, and uh, hospital. It wasn't that much, but there was like just a little uh, go back to the beginning. I think it was like your, um, it was one of those tables. Um, it was the analysis. Yeah, like if you looked, I think it was maybe on the other one. Yeah, there was another. It was one. the other. I didn't. I didn't include it in here. This is the yeah. E table two. It was a difference by site. Yeah, there was a, there was a slight difference by site, but it didn't hold out when we went by surgeon. Or I think it was a slight difference right. by surgeon, but it didn't hold out by site. So I think like there's a little bit of background noise in there that even with a bunch of people do this all the time, there's variable outcomes. So. You just got to take all this stuff with a grain of salt. But I, I do think that the, the, the biggest impact of this trial is that there's level one evidence now that if you did this, there's support that you're not. And that's why we did this trial, because we didn't know if it was safe to do what everybody was doing. And I think we should do more of these trials. We should do this with the robot. We should do this with everything new is, is just to ask the question for a second. Everybody's doing this. Is it safe versus the standard? Well, that's awesome. We should probably wrap up. Thank you so much for your discussion. Everybody, all everybody in the chat, thanks for joining us um, on this Valentine's Day evening. And just a reminder, all of these are recorded. So if you guys um, miss one, you can go to the ACHQC website and they are posted on the website. Our next one's gonna be in April and it's gonna be over chronic groin pain. And Dr. Kurpata, who is a groin pain specialist will be hosting that one in April. So thank you very much, Dr. Paulos, if you wanna wrap this up. Oh, sure, thanks again. Yeah, fantastic job, everyone, Kayla, Megan, and Ben. And uh, look forward to seeing everyone in April. Thanks again, have a good night. Happy Valentine's Day. Thanks.